Hello and welcome to part two of the particle model questions. If you haven't already, download the questions from the link below, have a go at them and then come back here to check through your answers. So let's get started with part two. Okay, so in part two we're going to be starting off on question number four. So in question four that we can see here, we've got a scientist that's carrying out an experiment to find the specific latent heat of fusion of chocolate which melts at 28 degrees Celsius. The experiment is carried out in a warm science lab where the air temperature is 32 degrees Celsius, which is pretty warm. The figure below shows the two sets of equipment that are used. So you can see here they've got two identical setups. However, on the right hand immersion heater, they never switch it on. The first question asks you, what is the purpose of the right hand equipment? Well, as you can see, the chocolate is melting in both. Now the chocolate will melt for two reasons. Number one, there'll be the thermal energy that's transferred from the immersion heater. But secondly, there'll also be the thermal energy that comes from the surrounding air temperature, which will also melt the chocolate. So by setting up the two pieces of equipment, one with the immersion heater on and one with the immersion heater off, we're using what's called a controlled experiment or a control. And this will allow us to see how much of the melting is due to the immersion heater and how much is due to just the effects of the temperature of the air and the surrounding environment. So the reason of the right hand one is to allow us to determine that. So therefore we can find the mass of the chocolate that melted just due to the energy from the surrounding air. Okay, so let's move on to question two. So in 4.2, we've got the left-hand immersion heater has a power of 60 watts, so that's this one here, and it's switched on for 90 seconds. Before the experiment, the mass of the beakers were measured, and after the heater is switched off, the mass of the beakers and their contents are measured again. The results are shown in the table below. Calculate the specific latent heat of fusion of the chocolate, assume that no energy is lost to the surroundings during the experiment, and that the temperature of the chocolate in both funnels is 28 degrees Celsius throughout the experiment. So firstly we need to know how much of the melted chocolate is actually due to the thermal energy coming from uh, the immersion heater. So for that one we're going to be able to compare these two numbers. So we can see that on the left hand side 210 grams uh, was melted, whereas on this side we can see that there was 90 grams. So the difference between those, so 210 minus 90, which gives us 120 grams, is the difference in the melted chocolate. Ignore the workings out there. So now we need to know the energy supplied by the heater. So for that we're going to use the equation that the energy supplied equals the power multiplied by the time. We want to find the power, or well the power is 60 watts, multiplied by the time, and the time is 90 seconds. So 60 multiplied by 90 is going to give us 5,400 joules. We then want to use the equation that the energy transferred equals the mass times the specific latent heat. We want to work out the specific latent heat, so we need to move the mass over to this side. So we'll do the opposite of multiply, which is divide. So we get the energy divided by the mass equals the latent heat. So the energy was 5,400, and the mass was 120 grams, which we want to convert into kilograms. So we're going to divide it by 1,000, which will give us 0 0.12, so 5,000. 400 divided by 0 0.12 uh, gives us 45,000 and our units, well we've got our units given to us here because 5,400 was in joules and 0 0.12 was in kilograms and we were doing joules divided by kilograms. So there's our unit for six marks. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Okay, question five. Describe the difference between the solid and gas states in terms of the arrangement and movement of the particles. And this is a four mark question. This is a really nice question to think about how we're going to structure it. Because again, we want to be talking about solids and gases. So anything that we say about liquids won't get us any marks. And we want to be talking about the arrangement And movement of the particles. And you can clearly see we've got one, two, three, four possible points. 
Now I'd recommend it in an exam, you lay this out in bullet points, but thinking about it in a table like this is really going to help. So let's think about the solid particles and the arrangement of the solid particles. When the solid particles, in a solid, the particles are closely packed together in a regular arrangement, whereas in a gas, they're far apart with gaps between the particles. When we think about a movement of a solid, now again, it's really important to remember that solid particles, the particles in a solid do move, um, so they usually vibrate about a fixed position. And then finally for a gas, well they randomly move around. And you can see that we're picking up our one, two, three, four marks. Okay, what is meant by the term specific latent heat of vaporization? Well, again, this is just knowing our definitions. So the specific latent heat is the amount of energy required to change the state of one kilogram of a substance. So that's our definition for specific latent heat. That's going to be picking ourselves up one mark. And where it clearly says of vaporization, we need to think about the state change that's happening there. So that would be from liquid to gas. And that's where we're going to pick up our second mark. Okay, and our question number three. While the kettle boils, 0.022 kilograms of water changes to steam. So we see we're already in our standard units for mass. Uh, calculate the amount of energy required for this change and it gives us the specific latent heat of water. So the energy transferred equals the mass times the specific latent heat. So the mass was 0 0.022 multiplied by the specific latent heat of water, of vaporization, which is 2.3 times 10 to the 6. And if we work that out, that gives us 41,000. Just remembering it says give our answer in standard form. So when we're using standard form, we want to uh, use a number between 1 and 10, so we've got 4.1, and if we were putting the decimal place there, we're moving it 1, 2, 3, 4 places, so 4.1 times 10 to the 4 joules. And question 5.4, the graph shows how temperature varies with time for a substance as it's heated, the graph is not drawn to scale. Explain what's happening to the substance in sections A, B and B, C of the graph. So let's have a look at A, B. So at this point here, we can clearly see that the temperature remains constant. And that indicates to us that therefore there is a state change occurring. We can be a bit more precise on the state change because we can see that it's happened once and twice. So therefore we know it's the first state change and therefore that will be the state change from solid to liquid. So we can say that it is melting. We could estimate the temperature if we needed to, but for four marks we've got our two points. Uh, then we want to look at what's happening in section, oh, that should say B, C. I'll change it if it's not on your ones. Uh, so let's have a look from B to C. Well, we can quite clearly see that the temperature is increasing here until it reaches C and this must be the change from liquid to gas so until it reaches the temperature which something changes from a liquid to gas so until it reaches its boiling point. Okay let's move on. Okay question six we've got our house uh, which hasn't been insulated and it's showing you the energy losses from the different parts of the house and the cost of those uh, for one year. So the total cost of energy lost in one year is a thousand pounds. What is the cost of energy lost through the floor? And we can see that every other one is labelled and the floor is not. So therefore we know that the total, which is a thousand, will be made up of all of those different costs. So if we minus all of them off, so minus 350, minus 250, minus 100, and minus 150 will equal x, what's on the floor, and if we work that on our calculators, we can see there's 150 pounds that's remaining, which must be made from the floor. So how could we reduce this loss? Uh, well, it's a simple one mark question, um, so the best way to put it would be to put insulation 
on the floor. Okay, moving on to 6.3. Uh, it gives us a table and it shows us how some parts of the house may be insulated. So here's the different parts. It shows us the cost of energy loss per year, which is the same information as in the diagram above. It tells you what we could do for insulation, which kind of gives us a clue for the answer before, which is a useful tip that you can sometimes pick up in exam questions. And it tells us how much that insulation will cost. And you can see there's quite a vary, uh, variation in different costs. So which method of insulation would I install first and explain why? So when I'm looking at which ones I install first, there's probably a couple of answers that you could give, uh, but the one that in, jumps out to me is the doors, and the reason why it's very cheap, um, and therefore proportionally you're going to get a lot of your money back. You're going to spend £5, and then in the first year it's going to save you £150, so it's saving you many times over what you've actually uh, spent. So I could say that it repays Quickly, um, let's move that a bit further. Which method of insulation would I install last and explain why? So again, the one that jumps out to me uh, is windows. And there's two reasons. It's very expensive. And it only saves you a hundred pounds per year, which is a small amount of money compared to the rest. You can see it have a really long payback time. If you think about how many times, how many years you have to go through from 100 pounds to get 45, 100 pounds, maybe 45 years to pay it back. Okay, question seven. So a student used the apparatus in the figure below to compare the energy needed to heat different blocks of metal. So they've all got the same mass, uh, they had holes for the thermometer and the immersion heater and they all started at the same temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. The student measured the time taken to increase the temperature of the material by 5 degrees Celsius. Uh, state two other variables that the student controlled. So there's loads and loads of things um, that you could put here. Um, for example, they would need to use the same voltage. Or the potential difference would need to be the same. Um, They've got insulation around it, so using the same material for insulation. You could also talk about the same thickness of insulation, the same mass, the same starting temperature, which you're given up there as well. Okay, next question. Why was a bar chart drawn rather than a line graph? So here's the student's results. Why did they do a bar chart? They like to ask questions like this, and the reason they use a bar chart uh, was because one of the variables was categoric. And what I mean by that, it's not numbers based on a number line, they're categories. It's either concrete or copper or tin or iron or whatever. Uh, that's when you draw a bar graph. Which material was supplied with the most energy? Give the reason for your answer. So they were using the same uh, power supply, the same immersion heater, so therefore the only difference was the amount of time. It was taken in seconds and you can see here that the concrete uh, was had the longest amount of time and so therefore they must have had the most energy transferred to it and uh, so the concrete time was on for the longest okay and then finally at the bottom there seven point the iron block had a mass of two kilograms calculate the energy transferred by the heater to increase the temperature of the block by five degrees celsius the specific heat capacity of iron is 450 joules per kilogram degrees celsius so for this one the energy transferred is going to be the mass which is two multiplied by the specific heat capacity which is 450 multiplied by the temperature change which is five so if we work those out we're going to get four thousand 500 joules. Okay, the question continues. Okay, so the student used the same apparatus to heat a kilogram block of aluminium and recorded the temperature of the block as it was heated from room temperature. The results are shown below. One of the student's results is anomalous. Draw a ring around the anomalous result. And it stands out there. You can see all of these lines here in a lovely straight line and that this one here doesn't follow that pattern. So that's going to be our anomalous result. Draw the line of best fit for the points plotted in the figure above. Okay, so we're going to look at this graph. We can clearly see it's a straight line. If we were in an exam, we'd be using a ruler. 
I've not been prepared and haven't got a ruler, so I'm going to do the best I can do freehand to draw a nice straight line between those results. What was the temperature of the room? So the temperature of the room would have been what the block would have been at zero, because at zero it's not been heated, so it would have been at the temperature of the room, presumably if it had been left within the room for a while. So if we go up from zero, you can see that quite clearly this line crosses 20 degrees Celsius. So that's our temperature of the room. And finally, what was the interval of the time values used by the student? Well, we can clearly see that this one here is at 2, this point is at 4, this point is at 6, 8, 10, 12, etc. So it means they were recording the temperature every 2 minutes. And finally, question 8, our 6 marker. So a student wants to calculate the density of this solid glass paperweight. Describe the method that the student could use to calculate the density of the paperweight. So this is a, um, a non-standard volume substance. So we want to work out the volume in some way. And we want to work out the mass. So our equation that we're going to use is density equals mass divided by volume. We want to talk about how we could find those different things. So to work out the mass, uh, we're obviously going to work out the mass using a balance, that gives us the mass. Uh, for the volume, we're going to submerge in water in a Eureka can. Uh, we're then going to collect the volume of water. We're going to measure the volume of water using a measuring cylinder. And we know that the volume of water will therefore equal the volume of the paperweight. Will equal the volume of the paperweight, and that gives us our volume. And then we can stick those values into our density to give us the density in kilograms per meters cubed. And yeah, that's what we choose to change our units into. And there we go, six marks, nice and simple, based on that RPA. So I hope you did well on those questions and you found out anything that you weren't sure about. Make sure you check out the rest of our videos and subscribe to our channel. And as always, happy sciencing.